first point I want to mention here is he is a loving friend. He is a loving friend. Love is more than just a feeling, like I mentioned in Sunday school. You can, people, you know, in high school and, and when you're younger and you say, well, I'll, I love this person. You fall in love. And that's great while it lasts. But then the feeling goes away. The feeling, it's not a sustainable feeling if you just go by the feeling. Because the first time they say something cross to you, well, I don't love them anymore. And that's what happens with a lot of marriages today. They're going off of the feeling. As long as you have that feeling of, I love this person, everything's good. But the moment that goes away or wanes a little bit, you start questioning things. You start, well, do I really love them anymore? Um, love is a choice you make. Love is not a feeling. You can say, oh, I love this person, and that's great. But when you, what you should mean when you say that is that you're, you're deciding to love that person. I decided to love my wife. Yes, I fell in love with her. And I, I, it is a feeling. The feeling's there. I love her. But it's not just, you know, we, I, I can't survive that. That marriage can't survive if I'm just, if, if we just love each other when the feeling's there. Because sometimes the feeling's not there. We have a new baby. <laughs> There's some sleepless nights. The baby will start crying and, and we'll, we'll go back and forth. And it's your turn. <laughs> And those times, the feeling's not necessarily there. I can speak for my wife as well. You know, after we got married, for her, it's no longer as, I'm no longer as great as I was before we were married. <laughs> and that goes for everybody. Love is a decision you make. And for a friendship or any relationship to work, be it a marriage, be it a friendship, there has to be love there. And it's a decision you make. A good friendship must have love because without love in a friendship, it turns into a relationship of manipulation. If you don't have love for your friend, but you're still having them as your friend, you're using that person. Judges chapter 14. Samson, you all know the story about how he starts hanging around with the wrong crowd, and he falls in love with a girl, and he gets married. And at the marriage ceremony, at the, at the reception, rather, uh, he says out of, out of having fun, he's having a good time with his new bride and his friends and everything, and he puts a riddle to the people. He says he gives these people a riddle. He says, if, if you can guess this riddle, if you can solve it, I'll give you these changes of raiment, I'll give you this, and I'll give you that, and we'll have, you'll win a prize. He's thinking, hey, I'm, I'm Mr. Big Man, they're never going to get my riddle. Because prior to that, he had gone, you all know the story, he had taken a vow as a Nazarite, and he couldn't touch any dead thing. And if he, took, if he came in contact with something dead, he would have to go and offer sacrifices, get clean again, cut his hair. And you know, the, the, strength of his, the source of his strength was his hair. And so he had gone by and saw a, a lion had attacked him, and he killed the lion. Okay, so he should have gone and offered a sacrifice. And then he's passing by again, and, and the beehive had, uh, some bees had made a home in that carcass, and they made honey in that beehive in that dead lion. And so what does he do? He, instead of shunning that dead thing, he goes in there and gets that beehive. And he brings it. He doesn't just, his sin doesn't just taint him. He takes it to his family and gives his mom and dad, here, eat this honey I found. He's corrupted them too. That's a lesson to learn. Your sin doesn't just affect you. It affects somebody else too. It's, no man is an island. But anyways, he gives him this riddle. He says, out of the, out of the, I can't remember the exact riddle. Turn, go ahead and turn there. Judges chapter 14. Judges 14 and verse, uh, let's see. 10. Give some context here. Judges 14, 10. So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do. And it came to pass, when they saw him, that they brought 30 companions to be with him. He's surrounded by his friends. They're not Jews. They're the wrong crowd. But he's surrounded by these so-called friends. And he says in verse 11... I'm sorry, verse 12. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. 
If you can certainly declare it me within seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. But if you cannot declare it me, then shall ye give me 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle, that we may hear it. And, and he said unto them, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. There's his riddle. Only he knows the answer to that. Only he knows what he did. Out of the eater came forth meat. That honey, that beehive was in that dead carcass. He's an eater, he's a lion. And out of the, uh, let's see, out of the strong came forth sweetness. It was honey. It's, he's thinking it's fixed because nobody has a clue of what's going on. But what do they do? They say, well, we're not going to give him 30 sheets, 30 sheets and 30 garments. So they go and get, it, they get together with his new bride. She's of the same crowd that they are. She's, they're her people. So they get together with her off to the side and they say, hey, tell us his riddle. You, you're, his, you're close to him. You're close to anybody is. Go ahead and tell us his riddle. Tell us the answer. So she says, well, I don't even know it. So she spends some time and she, she, she nags at him and she, just, she won't let up. And look at verse uh, 16. And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me. You don't love me anymore. And he says, And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her because she lay sore upon him. She wore him down. And then she goes and tells it to her people. And verse 18, The men of the city said unto him, On the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? So he says, somebody found out. Somebody told. In verse 18, verse 18, he says, And he said unto them, If he had not plowed with my heifer, he had not found out my riddle. What a good man. <laughs> He's just got married to this woman. <laughs> if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have found out the answer. Hmm. Verse 19, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, and slew thirty men of them, and took their spoil, and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. It's not a true friendship. Not a true friendship. He used him as his friend. There was no love there. He didn't care for him. Love is when you put somebody else's needs or wants above your own needs and wants. If it causes you discomfort, you don't care because you love them. It causes you, it causes you to lose some sleep. I don't care because I love my wife. It causes, you know, that's love. And the friend that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ is a loving friend. The Lord Jesus Christ loved you enough to take the guilt of your sins on himself and become sin for you. Literally. Sin personified on the cross. He did that for you so that he could take God's wrath on your sins for you. Why? Because he loved you. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. What did he get out of that? What's in it for me, people say? What? He got the short end of the stick, brother. He knew exactly what he was getting when he paid for you. <laughs> but he loved you anyway. Verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we, might, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Your salvation, what do you get for? What, what, what's that exchange? You put your faith and trust in Him, and He wipes away your slate. He doesn't just wipe the slate clean. He does away with the slate. When He looks at you, He doesn't see your sin anymore. He doesn't see what you do. He sees His Son. That's how saved you are. That's how much He loved you. Because he says, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He lived his 
all, back in before the foundations of the world. He's one, he's one with God, and he's, he's the Word before he came flesh. He knew no sin. When he was born and he, he, he grew up as a child, he knew no sin. He never sinned. And then when he's, he's an adult man being tempted by the devil, he never sinned. He spent his whole life, all of eternity up until that point, without the sting of a guilty conscience. And then on the cross, he became sin. The Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. He didn't just get the sting of guilt for one lie. He got the sting of guilt for every sin that's ever been committed. He became guilty of it. For someone who had a pure conscience and never had any guilt, didn't know what guilt was like, because he's God. I mean, God, God knew what guilt was like, but he never experienced it. He was never guilty of anything. All of a sudden, he's guilty of your sins and your sins and your sins and your sins and every single one of them who's ever lived or ever will live. That's how much he loves you. His love surpasses all other love. John 15, verse 11 says, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. He's concerned with your joy. He wants you to have joy. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He thinks of you as friends. He, lay, he loves you. He laid down his life for you. He is a loving friend. Second thing I want to say is he's a guiding friend. Any good, a good friend is one that... When you're in the wrong, he'll tell you that you're in the wrong. You have friends that are, are yes men, that whatever you do, they don't want to hurt your feelings. So even if, you're going, if, and if they see you're going down the wrong path, they don't want to say anything because uh, I don't like confrontation. I don't like, uh, I want them to like me. <laughs> and so you don't say anything. You let your friend go on the right way. That's not a true friend. A true friend is one that's concerned for your well-being. And when they see you going down the wrong way, they will say, hey, that's, uh, I put a check on that. That's not right. Jesus Christ is a guiding friend. He, do isn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't withhold correction because he doesn't want to hurt your feelings. He'll tell you. If you have a relationship with the Lord and you, you're trying to walk with him, you know when you're presented with a sin and you're, you, and you're, you're about to take part in that, you know You've experienced this. The Lord will say, hey, watch it. That's wrong. That's him. That's him being a friend. That's him saying, hey, I'm concerned about your well-being. I'm concerned for your good. I want you to do right. So watch that. Through his word and the Holy Spirit in you, he guides you. He guides you in the right way. Proverbs 27.5 says, open rebuke is better than secret love. It's better to just be rebuked about it and get it right than for that thing to be kept secret. And, and it's, it's better in the long run. He says, and he goes on in the next verse, he says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes correction hurts. Sometimes your friend, if he's a true friend, if he tells you something where you're wrong, it stings. Nobody likes that. But it's for your good. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You get the other end of the spectrum, Someone so-called friend comes up and, 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 and kisses you. He, he, everything's positive. Judas, when he went and betrayed the Lord, how did he betray him? He betrayed him with a kiss. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Someone who's always telling you, you're good, you're, you're the greatest. You can't do nothing wrong. They don't have your best interest at heart. But the Lord does. He's a guiding friend. When you're in fellowship with him, the Holy Spirit inside of you will say, watch out for that. Psalm 25, verse 8 says, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Mark chapter 6, and verse 32 says, And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, let me pause here for a second. You ever have a friend that you want to get rid of? <laughs> we all have. Someone who thinks that you're their best friend, but you're really kind of annoyed by them. They won't leave. <laughs> the 
Lord very well could have felt like that. He was tempted to, I'm sure. He was tempted in all points like as we are. He's trying to get away from these multitudes. He's been doing nothing but teaching and preaching to them and, fe- and, and doing these miracles. He will want some, some time away to rest. So he gets into a ship with his disciples and they go. But the crowd outruns them and gets to where they're going before they get there. He says he outwent them. And now he's back in the same spot where he was with the multitude. Verse 30, or Mark 6, 34 says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. He had already been teaching them many things. He didn't get burnt out with them, though. He didn't, he didn't say, I'm, I've taught you enough. Go relax for a while and come back later. He just began to teach them many things again. He picked up right where they were. He still does this today. You know you better than anybody else. And you know you, and you need correction a lot. Every day you have something wrong. Does the Lord get burnt out with you and say, come on now, I told you this already. No, he says, hey, that's not right, come this way. That's not right, What? don't say that, say this. Keep your mouth shut. Don't do that all day, every day. He is a guiding friend. He's a faithful friend. He won't, he won't not tell you something. He won't not correct you because he wants to make you feel good. Sometimes it hurts. Faithful of the wounds of a friend. And thirdly, he's a protective friend. People like to take refuge in their wealth. But that can vanish overnight. Before the Great Depression, people had a lot of money in the bank. And then... The, and then Overnight, it was gone. People, a lot of people did themselves in because they were putting their trust in their wealth. They can refuge in their money. And then when it's gone, your refuge is gone. You have nothing left. If that's your refuge, it can go away just like that. People like to take solace in their good health. And say, well, I may not have a lot of things, I may not have a lot of wealth, but at least I got good health. That's fun to say, but you're all just, everybody's just one doctor visit and the diagnosis away from that being taken away. Right. You don't know the things that are lurking inside of you. <laughs> if God wants to, he can take the, take the protection away for just a second and let, and, and, and let something happen. Your wealth will fail you. Your health will fail you. But Jesus Christ is a protective friend. He will never fail you. There is nowhere in the universe safer than in the arms of Jesus. Psalm 119 verse 116 says, Uphold me according unto thy word that I may live, and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe, and I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. The only true refuge you can have is in the Lord Jesus Christ. You pray that prayer, hold thou me up, and I shall be safe. Proverbs 18, verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. You You can run to him, run to his name and say, Lord, I need help. And he's right there. He's a protective friend. Any good friend, if you see someone picking on your friend, you're going to step in. If you're a true friend, the Lord's got you in his hand. He's a protective friend. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Psalm 62, 7 says, In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Psalm 62, verse 8, the next verse says, Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. He says, pour out your heart before him. You're in trouble? Pour out your heart before him. Run to him. He'll take you in and put you in his arms. And like I said, there's nowhere in the universe safer than right there, leaning on his breast. Isaiah 25, verse 4 says, For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. 
when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. You have uh, down in New Orleans, they have those you know, hurricanes that come up. And so they built, uh, they built what they call levees. They built the ground up as a wall to keep that, 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 that sea, that, that surf from coming into the city. During Katrina, the, the levees weren't maintained properly, so they failed and the city got flooded. But the purpose of those levees is to keep the water out. New Orleans, I don't know if you know this, but New Orleans is shaped like a bowl. Literally, this, the, the, the city is below sea level. It just goes whoop. And so you have to have those levees up there against the water to keep the water from just pouring in. When you're with the Lord, when the, it says, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. The, storm, the blast of the terrible ones, the storm can't do anything against the wall. You're in your house, and it's storming outside. You're dry. Because you get a wall there. God is a, the Lord Jesus Christ is a wall against that storm. There was a saved man named, uh, named Frederick Nolan who lived years ago in, in North Africa uh, during a time of persecution against Christians. Uh, he was fleeing from a mob who were trying to kill him. He was running. And uh, with nowhere else to hide, he, he saw a cave, a little, little cave, a little mouth over it he, on the side of the road. He runs into that and ducks into it. Not great protection, but uh, any, if anybody wanted to, they could have gone in there and just got him out. But he ducks into it, hoping for just a little bit of refuge there. And while he waited, he watched at the entrance of the cave. He saw a little spider. He thought it was a little bitty thing. And he watched it, and while he was waiting, trying to be quiet, trying to hide, the this, this spider starts making a web. He starts going all across the mouth of the cave and making a web. Now, you've all walked into a spider web before. I hate that. Uh, but it's, it doesn't take effort to go through a spider web. That spider web wasn't going to hold back those enemies that were coming for him. But he's watching it. And it's, it, in the time, in just a few minutes, this beautiful web, this, this delicate thing just spreads across the mouth of the cave. Now, Nolan's pursuers, they arrived at that cave. They saw that, they saw that cave, and they turned off the road, and they're thinking, oh, okay, he's hiding in there. And they go up there, but they see across the mouth of the cave, there's this unbroken spider web. And they say, well, he couldn't have gone in there without breaking the web, so they left. And as soon as the coast was clear, he, he praised God and he said, where God is, a spider's web is like a wall. Where God is not, a wall is like a spider's web. And that's profound. What he's saying, that that little spider web wasn't enough to hold anybody back, but it did. Because God was there. You take refuge in a wall. If God's not in that, that wall will just come right down. Yeah. Look at Jericho. Those walls were thick. And all they did was march around it and blow some trumpets, and then the wall just pff, fell down because God was there. The Lord protects us every single day from things we don't even know about. Every time you get in your car, you're trusting that you're going to get where you're going. You realize how many nut jobs are out on the road? That's not including me. <laughs> Every time you drive down the highway and you survive, that's a miracle. The only reason you do is because the Lord's protecting you from things you don't even know about. You're just mm -hmm, driving, listening to music, talking, talking to your wife, just mm -hmm, driving. Not knowing that he's, he's made this person correct where they're going so he didn't crash into you. He's made this person behind you put his brake, put his brake on because he's speeding up without knowing it. He's, he's keeping this accident over here from happening so that way you can get where you're going safely. He made you leave late to avoid an accident. So many things he protects you from. Let alone the fact that he's protecting you from an eternity in hell. He, he said in, there in... Uh, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. I've used that argument, I'll use that verse to, uh, to, to prove eternal security. You're not strong enough to jump out of his hand. <laughs> Whatever you think that much of yourself, that you can do something that would make God so angry that he'll say, no, I'm done. 
He's protecting you. But even when the trials and troubles do come, and they do, the right attitude is not, God, why didn't you protect me from that? No, he lets things happen. But even when, the, even when they do come, his protection and mercy are still at work. His mercy is still there. Amen. It wasn't as bad as it could have been. Uh, he protected you from a bunch of other things that could have happened too. So when he lets things happen in your life, he's still protecting you. And that's because, my last point here, he's a compassionate friend. He's a compassionate friend. When you fall, as we do so often, he's right there to pick you back up and set you on your feet. It doesn't matter how many times you fall with the same sin. And you sit and you go back to him on your knees and you come crawling back and you say, Lord, I'm sorry, I messed up again. He doesn't say that what that was this 70 times 7, that was enough. <laughs> I'm not telling you again. As a parent, you say that all the time. I'm not telling you again. Go do this. And then you tell them again. <laughs> no matter how many times you mess up, he's still there for you. He's still there to pick you back up. Luke 15, 3 says, When he spake this parable, he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? And go after that which is lost until he find it. He doesn't stop until he gets you back. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he, hath, when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. He expects you to fall. He remembereth our frame. He, he knoweth that we're but dust. He knows you have a sin nature. And when you sin, yes, you should not sin. But when you do, you have an advocate with the Father. And he picks you right back up and he says, "Don't. it's okay, don't worry about it. If you ask him to forgive you, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't matter that you've done this a million times in the last two days. He's still right there. It's okay. Come back. Get back up. He's a compassionate friend. When you're bruised, he won't break you. When, when all that remains of your fire is just a small little smoking ember, he won't snuff it out. When, not, when, when what you had before was a, was a raging fire of zeal, and, and, and vigor to serve the Lord? When so much has happened in your life to discourage you, all that's left of that fire is just a little smoke. And you think, I'm done. He won't put you out. He won't snuff it out. Matthew 12, verse 15 says, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. And he charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, uh, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. There was a time where I didn't really understand what that meant. A, a bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench. What is that? I don't know what that means. But then I went through some. When I was down at PBI, I went through some hard. And in class, we were going through Matthew. And we, we, we were going through, and he went through that verse. What that means is, smoking flax shall he not quench. That means when all that's left is just a little ember. He won't pour water on it. He'll get down there and he'll get down to your level. And he'll go. And he'll add some kindling. And he'll tend it tenderly and carefully until the fire's back. When your, bru when your reed is bruised, when you're, when you're down, he's not going to say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and suck it up. He'll get down there and he'll, put, he'll brace you back up and let you heal. He's a compassionate friend. Yeah. 
And in conclusion, friends on this earth come and go. The friends I had when I was a kid, I don't have them anymore. They're still there somewhere, but they're not in my life. And you all can say the same thing. But there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. There are friends that stick with you through all that life throws at you. And those friends are a blessing. They are. I count, I count Daniel as one of those friends. We don't talk all the time. We don't see each other very rarely. But when we do, it's like never left. Just pick up right where we were. And those friends are a blessing. They're rare. But they're a blessing from God. But no matter how good of a friend they are to you, they will let you down at some point. No matter how close you are, somewhere down the road, something's going to happen. Man will let you down every single time. But they, they pale in comparison to the friend that you can know in the Lord Jesus Christ. And just because you're saved, he's still a friend to you. But that doesn't automatically mean that you're reaping the benefits of that friendship. You can have so much more fellowship with him. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. That relationship takes effort. He's a friend to you no matter what you do. Are you a friend to him? Are you repaying that friendship? Are you trying to? Lord Jesus Christ, he loves you. He'll never steer you down the wrong way. And he'll protect you for eternity. And comfort you when no one else can. The Lord Jesus truly is the best friend you'll ever have. Amen. Truly is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, once again. On a hill, far away.